In a recent Vanity Fair article from February 2022, shocking revelations surfaced regarding allegations against Jerry Lewis, a beloved entertainer from the 1960s. Former co-stars courageously came forward to share their experiences, shedding light on a darker side of the charismatic figure known for his slapstick humor and philanthropic endeavors. Today, we delve deeper into this matter, confronting the uncomfortable truths surrounding Jerry Lewis's life and career. Who really was this man and what was his private life like? Join us as we reveal unknown facts of Hollywood's most violent icon. The beginning of Jerry Lewis's long career. Born on March 16, 1926, in Newark, New Jersey, Jerry Lewis emerged from a Jewish family with a rich entertainment background. His father, Daniel Danny Levitch, was a master of ceremonies, while his mother, Rachel B. Levitch, was a radio pianist. There has been some confusion about Lewis's birth name. Although he claimed in his autobiography that he was born Joseph, his birth certificate, as well as U.S. Census records from 1930 and 1940, list his name as Jerome. Similarly, there are mixed reports about the hospital where he was born, with some sources citing Clinton Private Hospital and others naming Newark Beth Israel Hospital. Lewis's early years were marked by his mischievous nature, known for pulling pranks during his teenage years that often got him into trouble. Expelled from one high school and later dropping out of another, Lewis changed his name to avoid confusion with other performers, setting the stage for his future in show business. By age 15, Lewis developed a unique act where he mimed lyrics to songs while a phonograph played off stage, which he called his record act. Although his first gig at a burlesque house in Buffalo didn't go well, he didn't give up. He worked various jobs, such as a soda jerk and theater usher to support himself. Eventually, a veteran burlesque comedian, Max Coleman, encouraged Lewis to keep trying, and he did. Irving Kay, a borscht belt comedian, saw Lewis perform his mime act at Brown's Hotel in Loch Sheldrake, New York, and was impressed by the audience's reaction. Kay became Lewis's manager and helped him secure more bookings in the borscht belt circuit. During World War II, Lewis, despite his desire to serve, was unable to due to a heart murmur. However, fate intervened when he crossed paths with 27-year-old singer Dean Martin at the Glass Hat Club in NYC in 1945. This chance encounter marked the beginning of one of the most iconic partnerships in entertainment history, the legendary Martin-Lewis partnership. Martin and Lewis, the duo captivated audiences with their zany antics and lively segments, quickly rising to national fame. Their comedic chemistry led to appearances in nightclubs, on radio shows, and eventually on television, where they made their debut on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1948. Signing with NBC in 1950, they hosted the Colgate Comedy Hour, solidifying their status as comedy icons. Their success translated to the silver screen, with Paramount Pictures releasing 14 films starring Martin and Lewis. Their popularity even extended to the realm of comic books, with DC Comics publishing adventures featuring the dynamic duo. They co-starred in 16 feature films released through Paramount during their time under contract with Hal Wallace. Though their films were popular, their working relationship became increasingly tense over the years. Martin often felt overshadowed by Lewis's over-the-top comedic style, while Lewis's antics started to dominate their films. Another reason for the tension is thought to be the relationship between their wives. Dean's second wife, Jean, and Jerry's wife, Patty, were said not to get along well with each other, which might have added stress to the partnership. Their tension came to a head while filming their final movie together, Hollywood or Bust, in the spring and early summer of 1956. Lewis later recounted how the atmosphere on set grew so hostile that he would hold back his opinions on Martin, leaving director Frank Tashlin to handle the fallout. Martin, on the other hand, became increasingly frustrated and famously told Lewis that he was nothing to me but a dollar sign. Despite the behind-the-scenes conflict, they fulfilled their last professional commitment with a farewell performance at the Copacabana Club on July 25, 1956, exactly 10 years after their first show together in Atlantic City. Their final film, Hollywood or Bust, was released in December of that year, marking the end of their legendary partnership. 
For Jerry Lewis, this marked a pivotal moment in his career. Feeling adrift, he found himself thrust back into the spotlight when asked to fill in for Judy Garland due to illness. Despite initial hesitation, Lewis's performance was met with resounding applause, prompting him to explore a solo career. Lewis's Journey as a Solo Artist In late 1956, Jerry Lewis began performing regularly at the Sands Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, marking a major shift in his career. The Sands signed him for five years, offering him the same pay he had received with Martin. Critics also praised his solo performances, and Lewis quickly established himself as a successful solo act. Supported by his wife Patty, he also ventured into recording, releasing albums that resonated with audiences. His rendition of classics like Rockabye Your Baby with a Dixie Melody and Come Rain or Come Shine garnered widespread acclaim, propelling him to the top of the charts and solidifying his status as a versatile entertainer. The single of Rockabye Your Baby went to number 10, and his album Jerry Lewis Just Sings went to number 3 on the Billboard charts, staying near the top for four months and selling a million and a half copies. Jerry Lewis's album success led to a string of other records, including More Jerry Lewis and Jerry Lewis Sings Big Songs for Little People. An EP of songs from these albums was released as Somebody Loves Me. He continued to release several singles over the years, but only It All Depends On You made a brief impact on the charts, peaking at number 68 in the spring of 1957. However, this wasn't Lewis's first venture into the music world. When he was still part of the Martin and Lewis duo, they recorded several songs together, some of which charted and were even used in their films. Lewis also ventured into children's entertainment, recording albums tailored to young listeners. It started in 1948, when he ventured into recording novelty comedy numbers and music for children, showcasing his versatility as an entertainer. Now note that after Martin and Lewis parted ways, Jerry Lewis still stayed with Paramount as he dove into his solo career. He kicked off his acting chapter with The Delicate Delinquent in 1957, followed by The Sad Sack later that same year. His partnership with director Frank Tashlin, known for his work on Looney Tunes cartoons, was a perfect match for Lewis's quirky humor. His collaboration with the director yielded several memorable films, although Lewis famously turned down a role in Some Like It Hot. He was approached by director Billy Wilder for the lead role in the film, but he turned down the opportunity and went on to star in Don't Give Up the Ship in 1959, making a cameo appearance in Lil Abner the same year. In 1959, Paramount signed a lucrative contract with Jerry Lewis Productions, offering Lewis $10 million and a whopping 60% of the profits for 14 films over seven years. This deal made him the highest paid talent in Hollywood at the time and gave him extraordinary creative control, including Final Cut and the eventual return of film rights after 30 years. In the early 1960s, Lewis continued to shine both in front of and behind the camera. He completed his film contract with Wallace and directed and starred in hits like Visit to a Small Planet and Cinderfella. Notably, The Bellboy, which he directed for Paramount Pictures, showcased his innovative filmmaking techniques, funded entirely by his own resources. Live performances were a key part of Lewis's career as well. Throughout his career, he made several television appearances, including stints on shows like What's My Line, The Ed Sullivan Show, and Tonight starring Jack Parr. He also hosted the Academy Awards three times in the 1950s, showing off his quick wit when he had to improvise for the 1959 ceremony, which ran 20 minutes short. Lewis's television presence remained strong as time went on, with appearances on popular shows like The Gary Moore Show and The Andy Williams Show. His appearances on these shows further solidified his status as a household name. Networks even clamored for him to have his own talk show, a testament to his immense popularity and influence. Lewis's fame continued to grow, and in the world of comics, DC Comics launched The Adventures of Jerry Lewis, a sequel to their previous series featuring him and Martin. This series ran from 1957 to 1971, showcasing Lewis's widespread influence on popular culture. The last films Lewis featured in and directed. The pinnacle of Lewis's directorial career came with The Nutty Professor, 
a beloved parody of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He played the role of Professor Kelp, a socially awkward scientist who creates a serum that transforms him into a confident but obnoxious ladies' man. This film is often considered one of his best works and is a classic in his filmography. In 1963, Jerry Lewis had a cameo in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World and starred in Who's Minding the Store. That same year, he hosted The Jerry Lewis Show, a big-budget show on ABC that ran from September to December. Lewis continued his film career with The Patsy in 1964, a satire about Hollywood's star-making industry and The Disorderly Orderly, which was his last collaboration with director Frank Tashlin. Lewis made appearances on The Joey Bishop Show and starred in The Family Jewels in 1965, a film about a young heiress who must choose between her six uncles. He played several roles in the movie, including one of the uncles. That year, he also appeared on The David Susskind Show, starred in Boeing Boeing, and earned a Golden Globe nomination. He also made guest appearances on Ben Casey, The Andy Williams Show, and Hullabaloo with his son Gary Lewis. After leaving Paramount in 1966, due to a corporate shakeup and declining box office returns, Lewis signed with Columbia Pictures. He took on new roles, including Three on a Couch and Way, Way Out, a comedy for 20th Century Fox. He continued his string of films with The Big Mouth in 1967 and Don't Raise the Bridge, Lower the River, and Hook, Line, and Sinker in 1968 and 1969, respectively. Through these roles, Lewis tried to branch out and reinvent himself with more serious performances while still delivering his signature humor. He continued to entertain audiences with this string of successful films and television appearances, cementing his status as a comedic icon. In the later years of his career, however, Lewis took a brief hiatus from the movie business, but remained a fixture on television, making memorable appearances on shows like Good Morning America and The Dick Cavett Show. His surprise appearances alongside former partner Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra delighted audiences and marked a poignant reconciliation between them. How Lewis's controversial personality affected his career. Lewis's contributions to the entertainment industry are undeniable, with his films and television appearances leaving an indelible mark on audiences worldwide. In 1976, producer Alexander H. Cohen brought him on board to star in a revival of the musical comedy review, Hell's a Poppin. Cohen saw Lewis as a key figure who could bring the larger-than-life comedic presence needed for the show. To create a dynamic duo, he also cast Lynn Redgrave, who had impressed him in a TV special of Hell's a Poppin a few years earlier. This was Lewis's first venture onto Broadway, and it was highly anticipated. NBC offered a significant sum, $1 million, for the rights to broadcast the opening night live nationwide. The show also underwent out-of-town tryouts in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Boston, which drew good business but received mixed reviews. However, things weren't all smooth behind the scenes. Lewis's strong personality led to clashes with producer Cohen, Redgrave, and writer-adapter Abe Burroughs. The dynamic between Lewis and Redgrave was particularly strained, with reports of them refusing to rehearse or perform songs together. The backstage tension eventually resulted in sudden cast changes during the Boston run. On January 18, 1977, NBC executives attended a performance and had a negative reaction, prompting Cohen to shut down the show and cancel both the Broadway run and the planned TV broadcast. This move meant forfeiting the million-dollar payment from NBC, but Cohen felt the show wasn't ready for Broadway and wouldn't be within the three weeks before the scheduled opening. Despite ups and downs, Lewis remained dedicated to his craft, making a triumphant comeback to the silver screen in the 1980s with films like Hardly Working and The King of Comedy. His television appearances, including hosting gigs and interviews, showcased his enduring charm and wit. Lewis's final film, Max Rose, and his appearance on Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee served as a fitting farewell to a legendary career that spanned decades. But in 1998, during the Aspen U.S. Comedy Arts Festival, Jerry Lewis was asked about his thoughts on female comedians. His response was surprising, as he admitted he wasn't a fan of women doing comedy. 
He felt uncomfortable with it, saying he thought of women more as nurturing figures. Despite this, he did acknowledge the talents of Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett, praising them as exceptional in their craft. Over the years, Lewis showed appreciation for several other female comedians, including Toady Fields, Phyllis Diller, Kathleen Freeman, Elaine Boozler, Whoopi Goldberg, and Tina Fey. These women brought a unique flair to the comedy world that even Lewis could admire. However, Lewis still faced some controversy during the 2007 MDA telethon when he used a slur in a joke. He later apologized for his comment. A similar incident occurred the following year on Australian television, which stirred further discussion about the language he used. Despite these controversies, his contributions to the entertainment industry remain significant. The relationships and infidelity charges against Lewis. Jerry Lewis tied the knot with singer Patti Palmer on October 3, 1944. Together, they welcomed six sons into the world, five of whom were biological, Gary, Scott, Christopher, Anthony, and Joseph, born between 1945 and 1964. They also adopted a son named Ronald in 1949, making their household a bustling family affair. Their marriage was a blend of faiths, as Lewis was Jewish while Palmer was Catholic, reflecting the diversity within their home. However, Lewis's personal life wasn't without its complications. During his marriage to Palmer, rumors surfaced about a daughter named Susan, allegedly fathered by Lewis with another woman in 1952. DNA testing later confirmed the likelihood of Susan being related to Lewis's acknowledged son, Gary. Lewis was known for his infidelity, openly discussing his affairs with famous women like Marilyn Monroe and Marlene Dietrich in interviews, revealing a turbulent aspect of his personal life. In 1980, after 35 years of marriage, Palmer filed for divorce, citing Lewis's lavish spending and infidelity as reasons for the split. The divorce was finalized in 1983, leading to a contentious aftermath where all of Lewis's children from his marriage to Palmer were excluded from inheriting any part of his estate. Gary Lewis, his eldest son, publicly criticized his father, describing him as mean and uncaring, reflecting the strained relationship between them. Following his divorce from Palmer, Lewis found love again with Sandra Sandy Pitnick, a ballerina and stewardess. They met during the filming of Hardly Working, where Pitnick had a small role in a dancing scene. They tied the knot on February 13, 1983 in Kissimmee, Florida, and later adopted a daughter named Danielle in 1992. Despite Lewis's tumultuous past, his marriage to Pitnick endured for 34 years until his passing, marking a period of stability in his personal life. However, Lewis's personal life was marred by controversy in his later years. In February 2022, allegations of sexual assault, harassment, and verbal abuse emerged from Lewis's former co-stars in the 1960s. Accusations from individuals like Karen Sharp, Hope Holiday, Anna Maria Alberghetti, and Lainey Kazan painted a troubling picture of Lewis's behavior during his time in the industry. These allegations ranged from unwanted advances and inappropriate comments to instances of physical assault and intimidation, sparking widespread condemnation within the entertainment industry. The scandal served as a sobering reminder of the prevalence of abuse and harassment in Hollywood, highlighting the urgent need for accountability and measures to prevent such behavior in the future. Lewis's personal life, marked by both triumphs and tribulations, offers a complex portrait of a man whose legacy is as complicated as it is celebrated. Lewis's contribution to the MDA charity. After meeting Paul Cohen, the founder of the Muscular Dystrophy Association, MDA, Jerry Lewis, and Dean Martin, made their first appeal for the MDA in December 1951 on the finale of the Colgate Comedy Hour. They followed up with another appeal in 1952. Lewis continued his involvement with the organization, and in 1954, he participated in a boxing match against Rocky Marciano to raise funds for MDA. By 1956, Lewis hosted the first MDA telethon, just before the end of his partnership with Martin. Later, he was named National Chairman of the Association. In the following years, Lewis hosted Thanksgiving specials in 1957 and 1959. 
His most notable contribution to the cause was the annual Jerry Lewis MDA Labor Day Telethon, which he began hosting in 1966. The Telethon aired live every Labor Day weekend for 44 years, spanning multiple decades. Co-hosted by Ed McMahon from 1973 to 2008, the event was broadcast from cities like New York, Las Vegas, Hollywood, and Chicago, making it one of the most successful and widely watched fundraising events in television history. The Telethon used iconic songs such as Charlie Chaplin's Smile and You'll Never Walk Alone as part of its introduction and outro. The Telethon achieved several milestones. It was the first to raise over $1 million in 1966 and to broadcast in color in 1967. It became a networked telethon in 1968 and expanded to coast-to-coast -to -coast broadcasts in 1970. It was viewed outside the continental United States for the first time in 1972 and later reached global audiences via the Internet in 1998. In the years following, societal views about disability and the telethon format shifted. Some criticized the show, arguing it perpetuated stereotypes about disabled individuals and focused on evoking pity rather than empowering them. Lewis defended his methods, believing that tugging at viewers' heartstrings was necessary to keep the telethon impactful. Despite some criticism, many people with muscular dystrophy benefited directly from the MDA fundraising efforts led by Lewis. MDA-funded research uncovered the causes of various diseases within the MDA's scope, resulting in the development of new treatments and care standards. Over 200 research and treatment facilities were built with donations raised by Lewis's telethons. Lewis's contributions to the MDA earned him numerous honors, including a Nobel Peace Prize nomination and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Medical Association. His work helped improve the lives of countless individuals affected by muscular dystrophy and related diseases, the health issues leading to the death of Jerry Lewis. From chronic ailments to addictions and illnesses, Lewis's journey was marked by resilience in the face of adversity. One significant health issue that Lewis grappled with was a back injury sustained during a comedic fall, a mishap that occurred during a performance at the Sands Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip, or possibly during an appearance on The Andy Williams Show. This injury, compounded by the natural aging process, resulted in a slew of chronic health problems and dependencies. Following the fall, Lewis developed an addiction to the painkiller Percodan, which plagued him for 13 years. However, he claimed to have achieved sobriety since 1978. Another health scare struck Lewis during his Australian tour in 1999, when he had to be hospitalized in Darwin due to viral meningitis. This illness kept him off his feet for over five months and led to a dispute with his health insurer over medical bills. The situation resulted in negative press coverage, prompting Lewis to file a $100 million lawsuit against his insurer, though the outcome of the legal battle was not widely publicized. In April 2002, Lewis underwent a Medtronic Synergy neurostimulator implantation in his back, a procedure that helped alleviate his discomfort and transformed him into a prominent advocate for the company. His health struggles extended beyond his back injury. He experienced multiple heart problems throughout his lifetime, including two heart attacks and open-heart double bypass surgery. His first heart attack struck at the age of 34 while filming Cinderfella in 1960, followed by a second heart attack in December 1982. His third heart attack occurred during a flight in June 2006, necessitating immediate medical intervention. Despite these setbacks, Lewis displayed remarkable resilience. After his third heart attack, subsequent examinations revealed pneumonia and severe heart damage, leading to cardiac catheterization and the insertion of two stents. Lewis made a full recovery within weeks, with improved blood flow aiding his recuperation. In addition to heart issues, Lewis battled prostate cancer, type 1 diabetes, and pulmonary fibrosis. Treatment for pulmonary fibrosis in the late 1990s resulted in significant weight gain and a noticeable change in his appearance. Despite these health challenges, Lewis remained dedicated to his craft, continuing to perform and entertain audiences. However, Lewis's health struggles occasionally interrupted his professional commitments. In September 2001, he was unable to perform at a charity event in London 
due to a sudden illness suspected to be related to cardiac problems. Despite these setbacks, Lewis persevered, overcoming hypoglycemia in 2012 and hospitalization for a urinary tract infection in 2017. Lewis's passing on August 20, 2017 at the age of 91 was attributed to end-stage cardiac disease and peripheral artery disease. In his will, he left his estate to his second wife and daughter, explicitly disinheriting his children from his first marriage and their descendants. Despite his health challenges, Jerry Lewis's impact on American popular culture is undeniable. Widely acknowledged as a comic genius, Lewis influenced generations of comedians, writers, performers, and filmmakers. His films, especially those he directed himself, continue to receive praise for their originality and inventiveness, cementing his legacy as a pioneering force in comedy and entertainment. The Legacy of Jerry Lewis Jerry Lewis was more than just a comedian. He was an explosive experimenter, pushing the boundaries of cinema with his innovative flair. In the late 1960s, he spearheaded the transition to independent filmmaking, breaking free from the studio system's tight control over the filmmaking process. This move, which later became known as New Hollywood, allowed Lewis to assert control over his material, showcasing both his entrepreneurial spirit and artistic vision. In terms of directorial style, Lewis was unmatched. He skillfully manipulated space through purposeful lens selection, not only eliciting laughs from the material, but also visually and structurally. His films were cinematically innovative, utilizing tools in formally unique and humorous ways. Filmmaker Jean-Luc Goddard praised Lewis for his refusal to conform to established categories and principles, recognizing him as a true maverick in Hollywood. Lewis's films were ambitious and narratively experimental, offering provocative commentaries on masculinity in post-war America and providing introspective examinations into performers' neuroses. His dark humor and satirical approach to celebrity culture set him apart as a groundbreaking filmmaker who wasn't afraid to tackle taboo subjects. Before 1960, most Hollywood comedies followed the screwball or farce style. Jerry Lewis, however, brought a fresh twist to the genre by introducing satire into full-length films. This shift can be seen in his early home movies, like How to Smuggle a Hernia Across the Border, filmed in his playhouse in the early 1950s. His mature work often provided sharp commentary on the cult of celebrity, the trappings of fame, and the struggle of staying true to oneself while fitting into society. Stephen Dalton of The Hollywood Reporter noted Lewis's agreeably bitter streak, highlighting his ability to offer self-critical insights into celebrity culture, which now seems quite modern. In The King of Comedy, Lewis played a role that influenced later satirists like Gary Shandling, Steve Coogan, and Ricky Gervais, showcasing his impact on the genre. Lewis was an early expert in using deconstruction to enhance comedy. From his early performances on The Comedy Hour, he exposed the artifice of onstage performance by acknowledging the camera, sets, malfunctioning props, and even failed jokes. Jonathan Rosenbaum commented on Lewis's impulse to deconstruct and even demolish the fictional givens of any sketch, including those he created himself. This approach became a hallmark of his filmmaking as he gained more control over his writing and directing. Lewis's self-directed films were full of behind-the-scenes reveals, demystifying the movie-making process. Daniel Fairfax noted that Lewis deconstructs the very functioning of the joke itself, while Chris Fujiwara added that the Patsy was so radical it made comedy out of a comedian who wasn't funny. The final scene of the Patsy is especially famous for pulling back the curtain and showing the audience the making of the movie and Lewis's role as actor and director. In his book The Total Filmmaker, Lewis discussed his belief in breaking the fourth wall by having actors look directly into the camera, even though it defied industry norms. Throughout his career, Lewis left an indelible mark on American popular culture. His influence can be seen in the work of subsequent generations of comedians and filmmakers, who continue to draw inspiration from his groundbreaking contributions to cinema. Lewis's death in 2017 was mourned by collaborators and fans alike. His talent and friendship were praised by luminaries such as Robert De Niro and Sandra Bernhard, 
who recognized his pioneering role in comedy and film. In recognition of his legacy, retrospectives of Lewis's work have been held around the world, highlighting his enduring impact on cinema. In 2017, he co-founded the Legionnaires of Laughter and Legacy Awards, further cementing his status as a cultural icon. Additionally, he was honored with a video display on the Las Vegas Strip, a testament to his enduring popularity as a casino showroom headliner in Las Vegas. Lewis's annual Labor Day MDA Telethon, which he hosted for many years, became a staple of American television, further solidifying his place in entertainment history. His legacy continues to inspire and entertain audiences, ensuring that his contributions to comedy and film will be remembered for generations to come. Thanks for watching. See you in our next video.